And this is 1983. The Flicks. We're the worst company in town, and we know it. The fashion. The trends. The TV. No whammies, no whammies. Big bucks, no whammies. The tunes. Come on, feel the noise. Coming at you in mind-melting 3D. Wow. A totally awesome year that gave us these burning questions. What the hell's a Mr. Mom? A guy taking care of kids? The mom takes care of kids. Mr. Dad, not Mr. Mom. Who the hell? What? Does truly tasteless equal funny? Just because a joke involves an amputee being lit on fire, doesn't mean it should be published. And how do you tell these freaking mom GGs apart? Which one's the girl? Which one's the boy? Oh God, I have no idea. They're identical. I don't either. The answers to those questions plus the dripping wet look. Jerry Curls is the most disgusting invention ever made. And Jesse Jackson tries to rhyme his way into the White House. Jeff it was trying to run. And he did have fun. Because you love the 80s. Actually. Because you still dream of being a star search spokesmodel. Admit it. You're watching VH1's I Love the 80s 3D. This is 1983 in 3D, headed straight for your muck. was if you're gonna 3d something you go with jaws or the way we were one of those i think but jaws is just as good a choice overman was killed inside the park the baby was going inside in the park the shark is in the park no, right now. i've got a shark in a public aquarium type place bad idea Dennis Quaid handling this situation. Bad idea. Then you got it in 3D. That's a bad idea. The only thing in 3D they would do is like somebody's hand would go, look at a shark. So weird. I am like tripping. Welcome to SeaWorld. Where we have dolphins but no sharks. Wait, what's that? Gotcha, you sucker. You freaking out? Hey, viewer, you freaking out like me? Without 3D, you would not have been able to appreciate the size and the contours of Leah Thompson's breast. Oh, thank you. Don't put that part in. There is a moment that is the greatest moment in 3D history where the shark is about to crash through the glass that separates the people from the tank. This was like a frozen loaf of bread that would just drift toward the camera. It's the worst looking thing you've ever seen. No movement. Didn't even try to have the tail go like this. Nerd. The shark is just hovering. Because in 3D, it's I guess it's cool or something. Nerd. Nerd. And then, And it busts through the window in the, in the aquarium. And guess who he eats? The Black Nephew. Every movie should be in 3D. Why didn't this take over? Because porn wasn't doing it. If porn isn't pushing a technology, it's a bad technology. Are they going to show clips of Jaws 3D on I Love the 80s 3D? And will that be like 6D? Or will it be 3 times 3, which would be 9D? From Hollywood, the entertainment capital of the world, it's round one of the semifinals on Star Search with your host, Ed McMahon. I can't wait. I'm going to go home, have some mac and cheese, sit in front of the TV and watch Star Search. That was the sh Everyone wanted to be on Star Search. To me, that was like my source of comedy. 
Even as a kid, I knew it was funny, and I know those people had no talent. You want the people to come on and be awful. But that was truly the glory of it. It was funny to see the people lose, too. Jennifer Padawan receives two and three quarter stars. They would be really upset. They'd be like, oh, sorry, it's okay. <laughs> they would make them like hug or whatever, you know. Like, uh-uh, I don't want to hug you. I just lost. I only got three stars. You got four. My favorite was some dance groups. They're so bad. And they yeah. had such stupid costume. Whew, that was kind of painful. Of course, everyone watched Star Search for the spokesmodel competition. Does she walk? Does she talk? It was the cheesiest thing. They would try to speak into the camera. Well, we keep you bringing them to you every week on Star Search. We'll be right back when Ed McMahon talks to the comedy competition. And then, you know, your celebrity judges would say, well, I liked that you could read. And you looked at the camera and, you know, you didn't fart or anything. Four stars. We'd have like a photo session. It was like they would do the snapshots. And a guy built me a sandcastle. He said he wanted me to be his queen. I don't think it was fair that they called the spokesmodels spokesmodels. Really, masturbation fodder would have been more on the nose. Right? <laughs> don't speak. Shh. Don't speak. Like so many kids, I used to imagine myself being a spokesmodel contestant for Star Search in the bathroom mirror. You're watching VH1's I Love the 80s 3D. We'll be back after these messages. Two and three quarter stars. What? I love the 80s 3D. Are these the munchie cheese? Are these so soft and cuddly? Machi chi was the bomb, yo. Chi -chi. This was definitely for chicks. Dudes didn't play with the mon chi chi, but we like the song. Mon chi chi, mon chi chi, oh so soft and cuddly. Put the thumb in your mouth, you're really sweet. <laughs> when they're little, honestly, pretty cute. When they get to be about this size, God. The mon chi chi was riddled with problems. First of all, it wore a toupee. I mean, this is obviously a piece. I kind of like that Noel Gallagher hair. <laughs> I'm a boy, Monchie. I'm a girl, Monchie. I have a ball. Okay, which one's which one's the girl? Which one's the boy? Oh, God, I have no idea. They're identical. I either. People used to call me Monchie when I was a little kid because I had like a little fro and curly hair. Man, you look like a Monchie. <laughs> he does. You know what the Munchie Chi do? They suck their thumbs. I suck that thumb. That's how you like it. Who's your Munchie Chi? And of course, you could always do the old <laughs> if you wanted to. Oh, he just put it. It was just in his butt. Now it's in his mouth. Gross. Basically, the Munchie Chi's molested my sister's Barbies by sucking their feet. <laughs> but the Barbies like it. And then Munchie Chi's died because of a rare STD. It was too much thumb in the mouth. And then they all. Happy, happy Munchie Chi. I love you, Munchie Chi. Oh, sh <laughs> Herbie Hancock's Rocket, that's 1983, yo. And we're trying to understand what instrument was he using to do all of that? Come on, Herbie. What instrument did you do to rock it? That's when we, Midwest America, was introduced to scratching. You can do it with your zipper, too. All right, I'm making my nipple hard. And then the video for Rocket is nuts. I don't know what it meant, but it was nuts. Rocket, those mannequins look like people going like this. Then there's a guy jumping off in, on the couch. You see that? There's a masturbating robot. Watch the video again. The, one of them, maybe I'm just seeing what I do. And you could only see Herbie Hancock on the TV in the video. Very bold. Very bold choice, Herbie. He's always into that weird abstract stuff, you know what I mean? Rocket was a hit, man. Rocket was a hit. Still a hit to this day. Awesome. 
I love 83. Coming up, Mr. Mom or Diabolical Dad? I seem to remember him dunking the child in a pot of boiling water. Am I, am I remembering that wrong? And President Reagan's pet science project. The only way it would have worked is if Reagan came out, introduced Star Wars, had Chewbacca come out and go, We'd all have gone, I'm for that. Next on I Love the 80s 3D, 1983. But first, movies that should have been made in 3D. Hey, 3D fans, Weird Al Yankovic here, practically jumping out of the TV and into your living room with the movies that should have been made in 3D for 1983. <laughs> Scarface. Wouldn't that be cool? You'd have Pacino right up in your face going, Say hello to my little 3D friend. Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. Don't you think that whole Mr. Creosote scene would have been, I don't know, more tasteful in 3D? And of course, Return of the Jedi. With a 3D Princess Leia in a gold bikini. Hey Java, is that an Ewok in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? And there you have it, the movies that should have been made in 3D for 1983. Because two dimensions just aren't enough! Carla Abdul here bringing you the teen idols who filled your daydreams back in 1983. Wow. The entire cast of The Outsiders, Pat, Tom, Matt, C. Thomas, Ralph, and my personal favorite, Emilio. Greasers forever. Those were the Teen Idols of 1983. Straight up, now tell me you're gonna be you and need to get back. Straight up. I love you, 3D. St. Elsewhere was an hour-long drama. It starred Mark Harmon as Dr. Bobby Caldwell. It also featured a guest star appearance from Denzel Washington as Dr. Philip Chandler. Now it's where it's kind of like ER, but a lot less gory. It's ER with train wheels. You know what people call this place? Not St. Allegis, St. Elsewhere. A dumping ground, a place you wouldn't want to send your mother-in-law. If you were looking for heart surgery on the cheap, St. Allegis was the place to go. It was just an unbelievable cast. You know, Mark Harmon and Denzel Washington. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And Beckley Jr., Howie Mandel were regulars on St. Elsewhere on NBC. One of the moments for me when I worked on St. Elsewhere that I'll never forget is William Daniels comes walking towards me on the set and the voice of Kit is coming out of his mouth. Listen, I'm calling about Ellen Harper. I was like, why does he sound so much like that real talking car from Knight Rider? Doc, I'm hurt bad. Well, that's all right. We'll fix you right up. Wait a second. You're the voice of Kit. No, what are you talking about, Mike? Knight Rider. But then they blew it at the end. On the show's last episode, it was revealed that the entire series had been the dream of an autistic child. It's been sitting there ever since you left this morning, just like it does every day. Shake it up. The whole show's been in a snow globe? Shake it up. Which is bull****, man. What is this going to be? Like, s suddenly Cagney and Lacey took place inside a slider pen? Shake it up. But I don't like to think that Denzel Washington is just in the mind of an autistic kid. Or Howie Mandel for that. Well, Howie Mandel is okay if he's just in the mind of an autistic kid. That's all right with me. Naturally. St. Elsewhere won many Emmy Awards during the 1980s. I really liked it. I love 83. Truly tasteless jokes. I remember everyone was running to the store to buy them. Truly unfunny jokes is what they were. Just because a joke involves an amputee being lit on fire doesn't mean it should be published. How can we really, you know, offend our parents? And it was these jokes. What do you call the hair between your grandmother's boobies? Her vagina. What do you call a black boy with a bicycle? Thief! <laughs> it basically gave you all your jokes in category form. This section just on Polak jokes. It's all about Puerto Ricans and Japs. Flat on page 29. Look out, homosexuals. There's a chapter about you, too. Helen Keller was the most popular one. Everyone had a Helen Keller joke. Do I think Helen Keller jokes are funny? No, I find them very offensive. Not. Hey, like, yeah. How did Helen Keller meet her husband? I <laughs> uh, don't know how. 
It was a blind date. Oh, I see. Because the... <laughs> if you're going to make fun of someone, it should be someone that is completely helpless, blind, and deaf, and can't speak. I mean, she's not going to come over to your house. You can't find it. Bring it on for my baby. Dead baby, page one. Let's read dead baby joke. Nothing's funnier than a dead baby. <laughs> Why do they boil water when a baby's being born? So if it's born dead, they can make soup. You think I made that up? You gave me the book. Don't get smart with me, sugar dumplings. Well, I'm glad they finally made it into print. Yes, we had been telling dead baby jokes underground for years. Finally, when it came to print, we felt liberated. Damn, that dead baby one was brutal. I'm getting mad now. It wasn't supposed to be funny. This is a... Who is this bitch, Blanche Knot? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta give them uh, kudos to the title. Nowhere on here does it say good, funny. They're just truly tasteless jokes. Sight. Dad? Yeah. Well, wait till this is cold and the cheese isn't hardly melted down. Yeah. I've got a snake in this kid. Mr. Mom, I refuse to talk about that until I get my wubby. Kenny, don't paint your sister. Have you seen Daddy Daycare? Mr. Mom is like that, but older. This is a real role reversal. A guy taking care of kids? The mom takes care of kids. Not the dad. Mr. Dad. Not Mr. Mom. What? Who the hell? What? Wake me from this nightmare. Where's Bobby? Keep the extra diapers. I love uh, Michael Keaton because it's all about the eyebrows. It's eyebrow acting. What do you mean? What are you talking about? I'm Mr. Mom. I'm Beetlejuice. Look at my eyebrows. I take a lot of pride in my work. Hey. Are these Kotex Mansi pads on special? Never mind, Derek. You know, I don't remember specific scenes from Mr. Mom, but let me pretend I do. He burns some stuff. I bet you there's a mishap with the washing machine. I seem to remember him dunking the child in a pot of boiling water. Am I, am I remembering that wrong? And I feel like it was when he was making linguine. That's probably not right. He kind of just takes on this whole, like, housewife type of life. And he has this group of women that he becomes close with, you know, so they talk about the soaps together, they go out to a strip club together. Man panties are thrown at his face. Man panties are, Man thrown, panties at are thrown at his face. Yeah. Within five minutes, he's... If you take care of a kid long enough, you will want to gobble oh See what happens when you send a man to do a woman's job? Coming up, DC Cab, an instant classic. DC Cab was like the American graffiti for a new generation. The star after star after star. Plus, the strange ironies lurking in ZZ Top's facial hair. ZZ Top's three-man band, famous for the two front guys with the long beards, and the drummer's name is Frank Beard, but he doesn't have a beard. Get it? Next on I Love the 80s 3D, 1983. But first, Chuck Woolery here with the best on-screen hookup of 1983. Tom Cruise and Rebecca De Mornier in Risky Business. Remember, he's a high school student with a house to himself for a week. She's a street-smart call girl who made a man of him on a Chicago L train. Maybe not the ideal pairing, but as we learn again and again, making a love connection truly can be, I'm going to say it, Risky Business. There you have it. Tom Cruise, Rebecca De Mornier, the best on-screen hookup of 1983. And we'll see you... Two and two. I love the um. Hello, darling. Elvira here with the biggest boobs of 1983. Wow, get your mind out of the gutter, will you, and your eyes off my chest? I don't mean these boobs. I'm talking about Kiss. <laughs> now, in September, the boys at Kiss finally decided to show the world what they really look like without their makeup. Now, this would have been great in 1977, you know, when they were popular. But by 1983, no one really cared. Plus, there was that whole, wow, these guys are really ugly thing. Oh, well, here's to you, Kiss. Biggest boobs of 1983. And I'm an expert. I love the 
Jerry curls the most disgusting invention ever made for hair. Just let your soul Ooh, those are some greasy days, baby. Greasy days. Jerry curl is basically a way of telling Mother Nature, screw off. Everything that's natural about your hair, we're going to go the other way. I mean, it was like a wet Bichon. It's the best I can describe it. I hate to put some of my own blast. Dougie Fresh had a Jerry Curl, son. I had a Jerry Curl that was so wet. I am not going to front. I'm going to keep it real. I tried to sport the Jerry Curl at one point, but being a white Jewish kid from the San Fernando Valley, it didn't work out so well. A white boy with a curl is a shame. African American, hot. White person, really, really sad. I just knew that you had to keep it moist with activator. You would activate your hair to delicious, long, succulent curls. Love school operator. Some people actually carried it with them. You know what I'm saying? Smooth. You look around a club, everybody's spritzing their hair with Jerry Girl stuff. So You're a grown man, dude. Put down the squirt gun, get a real haircut. This stuff will make your hair so greasy and so dripping wet that everywhere you go, you would actually mark up everything. If you had a Jericho, you would snake with it. Uh, smack, and they get hit with oil. And on that side, smack, then you back up. Wow, you hit, you know, it was all just a whole oil slick. The Jerry Curl is one thing that should never come back. I don't know how retro retro gets. It's a mistake against mankind. The Reverend Jesse Jackson says he has made up his mind to join the race for the 1984 Democratic presidential nomination. Jesse Jackson campaigned for the 84 election. That was really important for black people because we knew Jesse was trying to run and he did have fun. Black people was like, run, Jesse, run, run, Jesse, run. That was like his like theme song. Run, Jesse, run, Jesse. Run, Jesse, run, and Jesse, you can win. Where is he running to? Did he steal something? Jesse Jackson in 1983 showed that America was not ready and is still not ready for a president with a mustache. It's just too much too soon. It would have been tough to have a black president though, because everybody would be so scared that, you know, he was gonna bring hip hop and Cadillacs. That's what I think they were scared of. Cause we'll get real up in the White House. Everybody I think knew that Jesse Jackson wasn't gonna win, but we wanted to hear him. We got some power we're not called upon yet for ourselves. He can say anything, A, B, C, D, E, F. You are a ass. You'll be like, oh my God, those are the ABCs. Who is what you got? Jesse Jackson uh, was one of the first politicians since uh, Henry Clay to embrace the rhyming. If Mr. Lorenzo cannot fly it, let the workers buy it. The uh, congregation will lead to a multi-nation of semi-plation. <laughs> yeah, oh, semi-plation. I don't know, just put your fist up. He was doing pretty good until he got an off-the-record comment calling the Jews Hymies and New York Hymie Town. That didn't go over too well. It set a very negative and dangerous climate a a around my campaign. When Jesse Jackson said Hymie Town, it was a wrap. And the Jews came down on him with only the power of a Jew can. Jesse came in dead third. And I was like, Jesse, next time, shut your trap. From Television City in Hollywood, it's time to press your luck. Press your luck. I love that show. Peter Tamarkin, he was the best host ever. Yeah, you like that, huh? I never liked Press Your Luck. I wouldn't have even wanted to host it if they paid me $3 million a year. Maybe three. Let's do it. Let's okay. Go. It was a perfect 80s show because there was no skill involved. You had to answer the most banal trivia questions. It's often said the best defense is a good what? Give me the name of something with four wheels that drives. A car. Okay, you get to press your luck. Let's go. It's, oh my god. <laughs> big box, big box, big box. Big box, big box. No whammies, no whammies. Big box, no whammies. Yay!
<laughs> I don't know if people would jiggle. No whammies, no whammies, big buck. Fingers, you lick your fingers and bam! Maybe the lick your fingers wasn't part of it. <laughs> the whammies and stop! 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 Wow, 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 wow! Wow, 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 the whammies had all different costumes. There might be one dressed as Liberace. Good boy, George. Here he comes now. Oh, look at that. He's, he's dressed up like Kyle Sparks. Isn't that cute? Get out of here, whammy. Focus. It's easy talk. Now you're talking my language, lady. This is a top three-man band, famous for the two front guys with the long beards. And the drummer's name is Frank Beard, but he doesn't have a beard. Get it? If I was going to be in ZZ Top, I always want to be the guy with the stash. You know, the stash didn't look great. It looked a hell of a lot better than four and a half feet of growth growing from your chin. I don't know why that guy didn't grow one. I don't know why they ever went, hey, dude, we all got the beards. You're not going to really be a team player. Do you think that a guy tried to grow a beard and just couldn't? So they were like, yeah, just, yeah. No, no, it's cool. It's no, it's cool. cool. Yeah, I'm in through It's cool, yeah, it's you, cool. Little, you little half man. Peach Fuzz McGee. Maybe you didn't get the memo. This is ZZ Top. Grow the beard. I love the song Wags. It's so nice when you meet an ambulatory woman. The song was, was actually written about um, one of the ZZ Top guys' young daughter, about when she went from crawling to walking. It was actually, a she got legs, she knew how to use them, and then soon she'll grow up and leave me. It's, it's actually, it's like Cats in the Cradle. cradle. Yeah. Cats in the Cradle. When ZZ Top spun their guitars, I thought that was great fun. I was always trying to work out how they did that. And they had these, like, something in their belt buckle that they would stick the guitar onto, and then the guitars would spin around. It's all about being ZZ. That's what you do. You have furry guitars, a sweet car, and one guy who does want to be a team player, but that makes you rock. I love Coming up, the Reading Rainbow keeps kids glued to the TV. Reading Rainbow taught kids that the only way to read is by watching TV because it's just not as good in book form. Plus, the uplifting end to Terms of Endearment. Deborah Winger ends up getting cancer and then she ends up dying. If you haven't seen the movie, sorry about that. Next on I Love the 80s 3D, 1983. But first... Hi, I'm Alan Thick, the irresistibly sexy Dr. Jason Seaver from Growing Pains, bringing you the hot moms of 1983. Beverly D'Angelo, spicing up the family vacation. Susan Young of Webster, hot, but don't mess with Alex Karras. And Jacqueline Bissett in class. I'd say after school for her. Those are the hot moms of 1983. Hey, ladies, who's your daddy? She's a beauty. It's time to get your thinking caps on. This is the pop culture term of 1983. Hoser, adjective, initially Canadian in origin, this term is used to describe a loser or someone easily fooled. For example, that dude is such a hoser. Sometimes followed by, eh? As if asking a question. For example, that dude is such a hoser, eh? That was the pop culture term of 1983. And you've been screwed. DC Cab was an awful mess of a movie. We're the worst company in town, and we know it! DC Cab was, of course, directed by the auteur, Joel Schumacher. I think that this ranks somewhere below Phantom of the Opera, but above Batman and Robin. You know, somehow I didn't get any Academy Award nominations, DC Cab. <laughs> DC Cab was like the American graffiti for a new generation. Just star after star after star. I think Yakov Smirnoff was in it. Mm. All those bad 80s comics, I think. Louis Anderson was in DC Cab. Mm. Paul Rodriguez was in it. Barbarian Brothers. 
Mr. T is in it. I love Mr. T. Hey, why don't you off the street and get a decent job? I need the bread. Then get a job at the bakery. No matter where Mr. T shows up, there are always fools who need to be pitied. Especially in the D.C. taxi system. You, you gotta get to the airport by five? I pity you, fool. Shut up, Dale! Hey, Miss T, can you take me? I ain't taking you nowhere. Uh, I'm gonna tell you where I'm gonna take you. Uh, what the hell you think this is? I ain't your chauffeur. Uh, you gonna sit in the front. You gonna drive the cab. You hear me? Oh, sorry, Miss T. Hard to figure out what was more disturbing in DC cab, Mr. T or Gary Busey. <laughs> Who's more disturbing now? The answer is Gary Busey, of course. A movie like DC Cab is not really a plot. It's like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take Mr. T and Gary Busey and figure it out. That's why nobody ever heard of it. You see DC Cab? You saw DC Cab? Reading Rainbow. Yes. Butterflies. Butterflies in the sky. I can go twice, I can go twice as high. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading rainbow. Reading rainbow. Reading Rainbow was a very disturbing show where LeVar Burton read books on television to kids. Books, books everywhere. It wasn't really the coolest of shows. Just somebody reading you a book and you can probably just go read a book yourself. Today, we're going to read a book about a girl and her bicycle. And you know what the book's called? Girl and her bicycle. Let me tell you that this book is very crazy, but it's also a little bit serious. I think this is a great read, but you don't have to take my word for it. Reading Rainbow taught kids that the only way to read is by watching TV, because it's just not as good in book form. LeVar Burton's all about LeVar Burton. He went from good to get day to teaching the world to read. I want to teach you to read, you stupid ass. Cause you can't read better than me. There we go. Mr. Wizard's World was a great program on Nickelodeon that taught you about science. Well, not so much science as what happens when you mix vinegar and baking soda. What did you make yours out of? Baking soda and vinegar. It was like a nerd icon. Mr. Wizard was one of those guys that made learning fun and made learning cool. Sometimes it was fun and other times it was, <laughs> it was work. It depends entirely upon how the experiment went or how good the children were. Uh, Timmy? Yes, Mr. Wizard? Uh, this is coffee, and uh, for our experiment today, I want you to go get that amaretto. Okay. Just, just pour it in here. Okay. Pour it in. We'll see what happens. It's been a long week, Timmy. Big time for some science. You can do that, well, then you want an experiment with your own stuff, and you were blowing up stuff in your kitchen, and Mom didn't really like that very much. I would always try to do the experiments that Mr. Wizard did with his kids, but because he came out of Canada, they were always measured in the metric system. And I was like, Mom, how do I get 11 deciliters of oil? Come on, how'd you do that? They make science fun for kids, and I never thought science was cool when I was at school, but for some reason the show really did it. I stand by Mr. Wizard. I got his back. <laughs> right. Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It's known as Star Wars, a shield from nuclear attack. Star Wars was a missile defense program that I believe was going to cost 11 jillion, jillion, billion, thousand, gazillion dollars. An umbrella of sorts of satellites, rockets, and lasers. Star Wars was the bubble around our entire country to protect us from missiles. And the bubble was to be made from cellophane, rubber bands, and duct tape. The way the Star Wars machine worked was that you could bounce laser off of a satellite in space. Then it would come back down to the Earth. It would hit off of Nancy Reagan's cleavage and then off a mirror and then hit a Russian plane that was headed for the White House. Wow. It's the most hopeful possibility of the nuclear age, but it's not very well understood. So he got this missile program together and he thought, got to give it a snappy Hollywood kind of name. Star Wars. 
Showing how out of touch he was, Ronald Reagan calls his missile defense system Star Wars. Instead of calling it Missile Command, which is what it was, I think Reagan named the program after the movie Star Wars because the name Meatballs 2 just didn't fit. This was a serious program developed by serious people. President Reagan sat down with Secretary of Defense Atari to come up with this. Uh, and it was when the Joint Chiefs of ColecoVision came together uh, that the program really took off. The only way it would have worked is if Reagan came out, introduced Star Wars, had Chewbacca come out and go, We'd all have gone, I'm for that. God bless you and God bless you. Quiet Riot. Yeah! I was a big fan of the Quiet Riot. They don't make them like that anymore. It was all that metal wanted to be, loud and in your face and obnoxious. Metal health will drive you mad. That's when you've rocked too hard. Like, he rocked himself so hard, he lost his mind. Like, take a step back. Rock a little less if it's going to make you bang your head and go crazy. Tell you what I remember is this sort of, uh, this thing. They had this thing going, which I thought was scary. And this is before Signs of the Lambs. Not the hand. My hand is representing a mask. Quiet Riot was possibly the ugliest rock band of the era. The lead singer looked like Quasimodo. Like, except for the hunch, he could be ringing bells in Notre Dame. Back in the day, you could be, like, balding and be a huge rock star, but have, like, the total receding hairline. That throw kind of is all over the place. It looked a bit like Krusty the Clown. He did, didn't he? The lead singer from Quiet Riot looked like he'd be the lead singer in a cover band of Quiet Riot. But he was the real lead singer of Quiet Riot. Very confusing. Girls, rock your boys. We'll get wild, wild, wild. And then they would sing. Wild, wild, wild. We're gonna get wild. They were awesome. Awesome. Woo! What happened to them? They died with the decade. Coming up, <laughs> let the bawling begin. We left the theater in bags under our eyes, tears streaming down our faces, look like we'd been we'd been punched. Terms of endearment. Next, and I love the 80s 3D, 1983. But first, craving some 3D bonus material in 80s ringtones? I wanna run! Log on to VH1.com. Make sure to check out V-Spot. Guilty, not guilty, of 1983. The less than honorable Harry Anderson presiding. Defendant? Those terminally cute Cabbage Patch kids. The charge? Inciting a riot. Parents around the country were obligated to risk life and limb to obtain those weird-ass dolls that looked like the ugly kid at school that everyone hated. The verdict? Guilty as charged. Sentence? Borscht. Get it? Made a cabbage. Court of 1983 is now in recess. I love the 83. I remember going to see Terms of Endearment with my best friend Bradley. We were 12 going to see Terms of Endearment at the theater next to the food town at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We were the gayest little boys ever. I went to this movie. My mom and I thought we were going to see, like, a fun comedy. <laughs> and boy, wasn't the joke on us. Deborah Winger ends up getting cancer and then she ends up dying. If you haven't seen the movie, sorry about that. <laughs> we left the theater in bags under our eyes, tears streaming down our faces, looked like we'd been, we'd been punched. <laughs> I'm sure I cried. Honest to God, it's amazing I didn't get my ass kicked more than I already, than I did in high school. What did you do for the weekend, Mike? Went to see Terms of Endearment. Terms of Endearment was another how to learn to love my mom movie. <laughs> 
Oh, that's the first time I stopped hugging first. Shelly McLean is the greatest. Nah, 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 nah. I'd watch her read the phone book. She just said what was on her mind, even if it was politically incorrect or nasty. Why should I? Why should I be happy about being a grandmother? The most heart-wrenching scene to me is when she wants Deborah Wanger to be out of pain. Excuse me. It is after 10. It, give my daughter the pain shot. And the nurses are like, it's not time for her drugs. And Shirley McLean's like, give my daughter her drugs. You understand? Do something. My daughter needs medication. Get my daughter. And you're just like, give her the drugs. Why would they give her the drugs? Give her the shot. You understand? We're going to get Give my daughter the shot. As soon as it gets done, she's like, thank you. Thank you very much. And that kid by the bed when Demo Winger's dying. How do you not? I'm so sad. You're devoid of all emotions if you're not crying at terms of you. Take care. It is totally a chick movie, and I'll admit, I know I'm going to cry for at least four hours. Perfect. <laughs> I was so scared. I think it went really well, don't you? I love